Escape from aircraft in flight consists of three stages. The first is reaching the exit with parachute and safety equipment. The second is passing through the exit against the limitations of high-speed wind pressure and turbulence. And the third is clearing the aircraft without striking any part of its structure. As aircraft fly faster and higher, the difficulty of escape increases. At 40,000 feet plus, the air is thin, pressure and density are fractional compared with sea level, temperatures are many degrees below zero, and cabins and cockpits must be pressurized and air conditioned. One way of studying the problems involved is by means of apparatus which reproduces actual flying conditions with instruments measuring and recording the effects. G, accelerative force, is another complication which in a spiral or spin can make it difficult for air crews to reach the exit. Its effect can be tried out and studied in the human centrifuge, at one end of which is a compartment representing the inside of an aircraft. While the machine is stationary, it is of course perfectly easy to walk about in the compartment. But it's a different matter when the arm starts to rotate. The effort necessary to perform the simple act of walking across the compartment and back is obvious, demonstrating that in certain circumstances it may be quite difficult to reach the escape exits. Stage two, passing through the exit against the limitations of high speed wind pressure and turbulence, used not to be so difficult in the days when the speed of aircraft rarely exceeded 200 knots. In order to test the upper limits of speed, at which unaided escapes are possible from a single-seater fighter, a Spitfire fuselage was set up in line with the jet stream from a wind tunnel. When the airspeed exceeds 100 knots, the pilot is hard put to it to hold his head up in it. At upwards of 200 knots, he attempts to make an unaided exit. It is only by making a great effort that he at last succeeds in getting the better of the tremendous force that is trying to push him back into the cockpit. The clearance of the aircraft structure has been checked on this wind tunnel setup by the use of dummies jointed and weighted in rough conformation with a human body. The tests were filmed in slow motion and the films analyzed. This diagram shows, however, the need for caution in interpreting results on dummies and applying them to men. Wind tunnel tests have similarly been made with a mock-up representing an escape hatch in the side of a fuselage. At 100 knots, the escape was made without difficulty. At 150 knots, it became harder to get out. But at 200 knots, the subject had to make three attempts before he managed to get clear. This difficulty has been overcome to a certain extent by the use of wind deflection shields. A series of tests were made with the cockpit inverted. Owing to the risk of injury to live subjects, only dummies were used in this series. They were in a side-by-side -side seating arrangement and were released by remote control. The tests indicated an ever-present risk of snagging the pilot's equipment in the rear edge of the seat and cockpit combing. Even at wind speeds as low as 140 knots, hang-ups occasionally occurred, with the dummies descending no more than 12 inches before the wind pressure was sufficient to impale them against the rear edge of the cockpit. Negative G, produced by a bunting maneuver, would enable escape to be carried out at higher speeds. Some aircraft have escape hatches in the floor, and wind tunnel tests have been made on a full-scale mock-up to investigate the negotiation of these at varying air speeds. For instance, exits from the Vulcan floor hatch, from which escapers drop plumb down into the airstream. Some downward escape hatches are hinged to serve as wind blast deflectors. One object of these tests 
was to examine the possibility of men being deflected upwards by turbulence and fouling the aircraft structure. What emerged was that there were definite limiting factors beyond which unassisted escapes were either impossible or extremely hazardous in the neighborhood of 350 knots indicated airspeed. All these tests were carried out very near sea level. At higher altitudes, the air is less dense and the blast effect is less for a given true airspeed. It was to provide means for safe exits in emergencies above these limits that the ejection seat was developed. Designing, fabricating, testing, the team engaged on the production of the prototype saw it take shape until it was ready to pass its tests in the air with dummies for occupants. Would the answer be the same with a live subject? There was only one way to find out and there was no lack of volunteers from the enthusiastic group engaged in the work. The choice fell on Mr. Bernard Lynch, Benny Lynch as he's familiarly known in aviation circles. The seat with its guide rails was installed in the rear seat of a meteor. And here it goes. In that seat, each stage of the ejection had to be separately performed. Firing the ejection cartridge. Then, when the seat parachute had developed, separating body from seat, and eventually pulling the ripcord of the personal parachute. This is the seat used in that proving flight, the Martin Baker Mark I. The seat, together with the pilot and his safety equipment, slid en bloc up along a guide rail when a cartridge in a gun fixed in the guide rail structure was fired by pulling down a handle to which was attached a canvas blind to protect the pilot's face. The Mark I seat was manually operated. That is to say, after the ejection, the pilot was required to unfasten his seat harness to part from his seat and open his parachute by pulling the ripcord. A new ejection seat fired in a similar way has been developed from the Mark I. Automatic mechanisms which unfasten the seat harness and stream the main parachute are fitted to this seat. A back type Irvin air chute is used, modified to enable it to be streamed automatically. With this seat, on ejection, the time fired drogue gun and main time release mechanism, which incorporates a barometric override, are tripped off. Half a second after ejection, the drogue gun fires pulling a pilot drogue out of the housing at the top of the seat. The pilot drogue fills in the airstream and pulls on a line attached to the main drogue, the purpose of which is to slow down the flight of the seat to a permissible speed by the time the pilot's parachute is due to open. The main time release mechanism running through a three-second sequence, uncouples the drogues from the seat, unfastens the seat harness to release the occupant, and casts the face blind free. The drogues remain attached to the pilot's parachute pack, to its ripcord, which is pulled as soon as it takes the strain. The Mark III seat is a further development. A square seat pan is fitted embodying leg restraining lines to secure the legs against forcible separation and flailing during very high speed ejection, say 400 knots indicated airspeed. The necessity for leg restraint is demonstrated by this photograph of an ejection seat and dummy as they leave the aircraft. It is all over so quickly that it is difficult to see what happens, so the action has been repeated and slowed down by the cartoon method. You will see that as the legs come out into the airstream, they are forced apart and start to flail.
Had the dummy been a human being, serious damage to the hip joints would almost certainly have ensued at the high speed at which this test was carried out. The type of ejection gun used depends upon the ejection velocity required to propel the seat and its occupant clear of the aircraft structure. This gun is designed to give a velocity of 60 feet per second. And this, 80 feet per second. The 80 feet gun is fitted to the Mark III seat and may be fitted to some earlier seats. The increased velocity necessary to clear the fins of aircraft such as the Javelin and the V bombers is achieved within the acceptable acceleration limits by giving the gun a longer stroke and auxiliary cartridges. In many cases, it's desirable that the aircraft hood be jettisoned. The control for this will eventually be linked to the ejection seat control operating jacks beneath the hood frame. Before the pilot takes his seat, it is desirable where possible that a check is made that the firing cable, drill gun connection, and the time release mechanism operating cable are correctly secured. The pilot must remove the safety pin from the firing handle safety strap and place it in the stowage at the side of the seat. After entering the aircraft, he connects the dinghy to the life-saving waistcoat by means of the quick-release attachments. He fastens the parachute harness. A manual override is provided so that in the event of damage to the automatic mechanism, the escape drill can still be carried out. If he is wearing an anti-G suit, he connects the hose. The two leg restraining lines are connected to the cockpit floor by roller brackets designed to pull away when the seat leaves the aircraft. The line attached to the bracket near the pilot's left heel passes through a snubber unit fixed to the seat pan and is threaded through a D-ring strapped to his leg below his right knee. The other end of the line will be connected by a loop to the shoulder lugs of the safety harness, likewise from right heel to left knee. After the lap strap of the safety harness has been done up over the leg restraining lines, the shoulder strap lugs are threaded through the loops before insertion in the box. The lines are arranged to allow free movement of the legs when seated. On ejection, the lines tighten up and hold the legs firmly until the harness is released. It remains to connect the main and emergency oxygen supply tubes and the telemic plug. The last ditch handle with its own safety pin on the front of the seat pan is for emergency use if the blind mechanism cannot be operated. Now as to the effect of firing the cartridge on the pilot's body. Test rigs are available consisting of a seat fitted in guide rails mounted on a steel girder tower by means of which these effects can be observed. An accelerometer is carried on a belt round the subject's waist, resting on his hip, and another is fixed on the side of the helmet. A third is fixed to the seat itself. These record the accelerative forces applied to the seat and its occupant. The accelerometers are connected electrically with recording instruments.
this instance, records are being taken of the amounts of G experienced by the subject on the test rig, as measured by his accelerometers. Another test carried out on the centrifuge deals with the feasibility of putting the firing handle on an ejection seat under a considerable degree of G. Although this subject is reaching 6 G, note the effect on his facial muscles and how he is being pushed down into his seat, he can still reach the handle successfully. The seat guide rails are tilted backwards in relation to the line of the pilot's back so that, on ejection, his knees follow an upward and backward path and do not foul the windscreen or cockpit arch. There is therefore an included angle between the line of the pilot's body and the guide rails. In no installation at present does this angle exceed 18 degrees, which gives room for the stowage of drogue and parachute. When the ejection seat cartridge is fired, it acts first on the seat structure and starts to compress the spring of the seat pack. When the man himself begins to move, his acceleration will be due to two factors. The acceleration acting on the seat structure and that due to the oscillation set up by the compression of the seat pack. This line represents the acceleration of the seat structure. To clarify the effect of the oscillation caused by the spring of the seat cushion, this dotted line denotes the associated behavior curve of the man's body. It is apparent that the initial impulse takes longer to affect the man's body than it does the seat. That is, the man lags behind the seat initially. But that soon the spring of the seat, as it recovers from its first compression, overshoots and adds an additional component to the normal acceleration of the seat structure. The man accelerates faster than the seat. Thus, an acceleration is set up which might well prove dangerous if the standard seat pack and particularly the cushion are interfered with. The practice of putting in a layer of sorbo rubber has led to a number of serious back injuries. Here is the correct body position. Legs drawn back and placed on foot rests if provided. Knees together. Head on rest. The back firmly in contact with the seat structure which acts as a supporting splint. Hands grasping the handle with palms inward, elbows close together. In an emergency, if ejection becomes necessary, the hood is normally jettisoned. Where there is no metal obstruction over the pilot, it is feasible to eject through the perspex. Reference to this will be found in pilot's notes for the particular aircraft. The pulling of the firing handle brings a protective blind over the face and at the same time fires the seat gun primary cartridge. In later types of seat, the hood jettisoning mechanism is linked to the firing handle so that only one movement is required. When the hot gases reach the secondary cartridge, it ignites and adds its energy to the previous charge, thus increasing the seat velocity. As soon as the seat starts to move, two timing mechanisms are tripped off. One of these will fire the drogue gun after half a second. The primary drogue, a small one, 18 inches in diameter, is nevertheless large enough to steady the seat and slow it down. At the same time, it pulls on the line attached to the main drogue, which is thus drawn from its pack to help deceleration. The other timing mechanism tripped off when the seat left the rail is one that after a three seconds delay, releases the drogue from the seat and unfastens the pilot's seat harness. The freed drogue, as it streams away, pulls on a line which draws the pilot's parachute from its stowage. The pilot is still attached to the seat by a couple of restraining straps, but as soon as the parachute is fully developed, it pulls him away from the straps and lifts him clear from the seat to make his descent in the normal way. The interval of three seconds between the exit from the aircraft and the separation of the pilot from the seat and the deployment of his parachute in conjunction with the use of an 80 feet per second gun, renders low altitude ejection feasible. This is a slow motion shot of the ejection of a dummy at low altitude, 50 feet, slowed down approximately 10 times, actual speed of aircraft 600 knots, from which the sequence of events can be clearly followed. The pilot drogue steadies the seat and withdraws the main drogue 5 feet in diameter. In due course, under the control of the timing mechanism, 
This drogue pulls on a line which withdraws the pilot's parachute from its pack and releases his safety harness. The pull of the parachute lifts him out of his seat which drops away behind him. More spectacular is this test in which ejection was effected by a live subject, squadron leader Fifield, while the aircraft was still on the runway. The seat used was a Martin Baker Mark II with a specially modified time release sequence, not at present in general use, and an 80 feet per second gun.